we finally get to meet Frank. Hello, Emmett Ryan here from Ball and Europe. Delighted to be with you again. We have a very special guest today. I spoke with Frank Dallarez. He is the sports editor of City AM. And he spoke with me all about everything we've been dealing with the last couple of weeks involving Zal Girish and the London Lions. Now, the injury happened yesterday before we got the news, which happened this morning, involving, obviously, Sam Decker. I have a link to the story somewhere up here. I'm not sure if I'm pointing the right way, so let's point both ways. And somewhere there is the link to the story with Sam Decker, so check that out. So none of that is in this but one thing that really helps is if you all subscribe that'd be great and the first thing I wanted to talk to Frank about was exactly how London Lions ended up in this mess to begin with I suppose it, it starts with the triple sevens ownership of the of the franchise um, you know which which began a few years ago 2020 I think and um, really you know in all the time that they've been involved in their various sporting investments there's been um, a lot of murmurings really about the um, the solidity of their business model and how resilient it could possibly be and questions about, you know, late payments, missed payments, loans, things like that at some of their various other entities. And so it's fair to say there was a kind of growing drumbeat of unease about 777's ownership of the London Lions and, of course, the uh, British Basketball League as well, um, that really came to a head, I guess, um, towards the end of the basketball season, towards the end of the football season, just before the, the start of the summer, when uh, more serious stories started to come out about um, that, that pointed to the fact that they were running out of money, basically. And I'm talking about the London Lions here. Um, so I think it was in March or April that we got wind that um, the women's team were not going to be entered into the Euro League next season. This despite being in the semi-finals at this stage. And of course, that was a competition they went on to win. Um, and so that was a real, you know, alarm bells going off moment. Um, and I think that just heightened scrutiny on what was happening at, at the club more widely. And it, it just gave the impression that there was a real degree of uncertainty about what was going to happen beyond the summer. So now we know how they got there. But how did Zalgiris and Tessanet end up being the ones that actually own them? We do know, obviously, is that Tessanet eventually bought them um, in a transaction that was completed earlier earlier this month. But before that point, quite a lot happened, as I'm sure you know. Some people watching this will be aware, and, and I know you are well aware of. Um, but you know, to cut a long story short, Zalgiris and Tessanet identify London Lions as a potential acquisition. They tried to buy them before they went into administration. They weren't able to do that for whatever reason. The club went into administration in a move that, you know, was actually ultimately triggered by them. And then they ultimately bought the club out of administration after agreeing a deal with the administrators. And that's where we've got how we got to where we are now. Now, those of you who would have watched this from the start, going back to my first video, I'll link it up above, uh, will remember that, you know, it looked like, okay, this is a done deal quite a while ago. Then there was a dramatic twist, which is really where Frank enters this story uh, involving the ownership, or really the claimed ownership at the time that wasn't ownership, of the London Lions by Zalgiris and Tessonet. So, there was this dramatic twist, but how did it even come about? Mm. I just got a press release one morning from, uh, you know, on behalf of Hudson Weir, announcing that they'd been appointed administrators for the London Lions and that they um, were basically soliciting offers. Um, and at that point, I hadn't really been covering the story closely. I'd had, you know, an eye on it. Um, but I wasn't actually aware of the fact that um, Zalgiris had already previously announced a takeover and it was pointed out to me um by some other reporters um at which point i thought well hang on a minute this doesn't add up so i quickly went back to the um the public relations people acting on behalf of hudson weir and said look what's going on here you've put out a press release but seven days earlier you know it, it, it seems to have been announced as a done deal um, and they said, right, okay, hold on. We will uh, put you in touch with 
the, the administrators themselves. You can speak to them and they can answer any of your questions. So that's what happened. Things moved quite quickly that day. I spoke to them at lunchtime, put the story out straight away in which they insisted that um, in no way had Zalgiris or Testnet acquired London Lions. A deal hadn't been done and they were the only ones who were mandated to sell the club. Um, so that seemed to clear up the position at least initially uh, so i put that story out and then yeah tried to wrap my head around all the rest of it i guess so after all of that the deal still happened it still went through and zalgiris tessonet now own the london lions so what did frank just make of it all obviously it wasn't a surprise that it was zalgiris tessonet that, that ended up buying london lions they'd been the ones that had made their interests clear earlier than everybody else and in fact that really was, I think, decisive in their bid being chosen. Um, I can't speak for the administrators, and I'm not privy to the exact, um, you know, uh, reasons why they chose the Tessinet bid. You know, it was just described as the best overall bid. But the fact is that. Um, had anyone else bought the London Lions, there was an absolutely no guarantee whatsoever that they were going to be playing in the British Basketball League or the Super League Basketball as it's as the Phoenix competition is going to be known. Um, so you would have had a you would have owned a club, a, a brand, and a load of debt, uh, but not actually a, a, a team or a comp one that was entered into any sort of competition that you could then sort of make money off. So um, yeah, it, it, it seemed to be. Uh, kind of, you know, massively skewed in favour of of Tessinet and Zalgiris. Um, but, you know, the administrators are very clear that they had serious discussions with other parties. Um, you know, there were, I think, three offers with proof of funds, two more um, offers that didn't get to the proof of fund stage, and I think two or three other seriously interested parties. I think one of the problems was that you know, this was all done in a very short time frame. So you're asking, you know, somebody to come forward, basically decide they might want to buy the London Lions and actually do the deal really quickly. And in that time, they didn't just have to satisfy the administrator's requirements and answer their questions. They also had to um, go through the due diligence of Super League basketball, which was this, you know, there was this whole thing going on behind the scenes that, that wasn't public, basically. But um, yeah, it became clear to me very quickly after writing the initial story that this was going to be a huge sticking point. So um, I tried to seek some clarity from um, the British Basketball Federation, who then put me in touch with Super League Basketball. And having spoken to, you know, a source there, um, they were able to give me, you know, on the record clarification that Tessinet were the only party that had met their requirements basically by the deadline that they had set in order to complete the deal in time for the new season so i published that story basically i think you know the following day and um that seemed to be that seemed to everything seemed to point to tessanet doing the deal so when they did do the deal it was no surprise but i suppose the one thing we don't know is what would have happened if you had you know, a very well resourced and very credible bidder go to the administrators um, and produce a you know a, a, a deal that was better in in every single way um, than Tessinets financially, but also could match their kind of um, their know how and and their resources. Uh, what would have happened if 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 they had presented a bid to the administrators, would would the administrators have would would they have chosen them? And would Super League Basketball have perhaps, you know, been willing to compromise on their deadline? We don't know, but I think Tessinet was the was the kind of the tap in, and and it was tapped in. Now, throughout all this, the one thing which most people following this, be they Algiers fans, be they London Lions fans, or be they just interested observers like you and me, um, you know, we all were wondering what exactly is in it for Zalgiris and Tessinet. In my previous videos, I've expanded on some theories, possibly involving a future sale, possibly other stuff. 
But Frank's got a very interesting approach to this, a very interesting mindset, uh, which is memorable, me reminiscent, sorry, of, I suppose, Man City of all clubs. We don't know is the, is, the, is the honest answer because they haven't really come out and said anything yet, either publicly or in private. Um, so all we've got to go on is the initial statement that was on the Zalgiris website, I think on the 31st of July, where they um, prematurely announced the acquisition of London Nines. And in that, there was some detail about you know, how they envisaged the lines fitting into their, their kind of multi-club network as it is now. And we know from, from football, anyone who follows European football and looks at things like City Football Group, the Red Bull Group, uh, these multi-club ownership networks, um, there tends to be a club that is at the top of the food chain and other clubs that are lower down the food chain whose purpose is to um, either uh, source and develop players or act as a kind of um, a development club. So, you know, Man City might sign a Brazilian teenager and loan them out to one of their uh, other clubs in their, in their network, in the City Football Group network, and then bring that player in in two or three years' time when they're, you know, ready for the Premier League. Well, you know, the, the, the stuff that Zalgir has put out indicated that that might be the kind of um objective with the acquisition of london nines that that that, that might be how they see the london nines uh fitting into their network i suppose they would argue that you know and and, and this is often the argument when you see you know clubs become feeder clubs in in football is that in exchange london nines are going to get a whole lot of expertise they may get to loan promising players who otherwise, you know, that might improve their squad. Certainly the, the days of them spending big on their roster look to be gone. So they probably will take what they can get in that sense. Um, so, you know, yeah, Zalgiris will make the, make the case that, you know, it's not a one-way street. Um, and the other thing that occurs to me as well about this, and some people may disagree, but... London just seems like a huge market for basketball. We know that when the NBA teams come over here, that they haven't for a few years. When they did, um, it was always a huge success. We saw the US Olympic team play over here just before Paris 2024, and, and those games sold out as well. So we know there is an appetite for watching basketball in London. Whether that has successfully been translated into you know, a viable business at domestic level, no, clearly it hasn't yet, but there is huge potential there. And I think, you know, we don't know what's coming down the track with Super League basketball and how more sustainable that might prove to be. Um, big question marks, of course. But, you know, it's not pie in the sky to think that, you know, for a relatively small outlay relatively small risk buying a london basketball franchise might be worth a shot because the upside could be so great one day so yeah that uh one thing which really does jump out doesn't it is what frank is saying like because i've not heard a word from zalgiris or tessanet since their original statement the one that was all the way back before hudson weir and all of those got involved they haven't said anything about this at all and Let's be honest, that original statement probably only went up because of my first video, which is even weirder when you think about it, uh, just given the timing. Uh, so, at least, sorry, not my, sorry, my first video, but my uh, first post. So, why have they been so silent? And has Frank heard anything from them? Uh, I haven't heard anything from them, no. Um, it does surprise me that we've got to this point and we haven't heard anything else. Um, perhaps they got their fingers burnt a little bit by prematurely announcing it in July. Um, perhaps there are some questions about why they prematurely announced it in July that they don't particularly want to have to address right now. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, you know, we can only speculate as to why that might be. But, I mean, this, this, this takeover was kind of rubber stamped by the administrators getting on for two weeks ago now. So... It is surprising that, that they haven't come in. It's surprising that they didn't just say something at the time, frankly. And it's kind of weird, I'd say, at this point, 
that they haven't said anything more because London Lions are selling season tickets on their website. And this goes for London Lions as well, by the way. I mean, they put out one statement, you know, at the start of last week, confirming the takeover and then trumpeting a new era and everything. But they haven't faced any questions about it. The details are very thin on the ground. Um, and so fans are being asked to buy something that there's still a huge number of question marks about. At the end of the day, uh, there is still a small matter of the London Lions now exists and will be playing in what's going to be called Super League Basketball. That's essentially the replacement for the British Basketball League, the BBL as we knew it. So I figured I have to ask Frank, given he is in London, uh, you know, and has been covering this story and covering the Lions situation, what he reckons is in store for both the Lions and SLB, I suppose we'll call it, uh, Super League Basketball as a whole. I'm going to qualify this by saying, you know, we need to hear from them what they believe the vision is for the for the, the coming years. Um, and, and again, that has been thin on the ground. If we take London Lions, first of all, um, just again, going by the little bits of information that are out there. So ref referring to the statement they put out, acknowledging the takeover at the start of last week, they talked about running a much more sustainable operation. Um, so I don't think it takes, you know, a genius to work out that um, that they're going to be tightening the belts considerably, I think. So I think the, the budgets that they've been operating on in the past are a thing of the past, at least until they can, um, you know, generate the revenue to justify that. Um, there's obviously going to be a salary cap, I think, in the new league. So that's going to restrict them too. Um, so I think the future for London Lions is... Uh, they will exist, which is was not a given, uh, you know, a month ago. Um, but they are unlikely to be the, the dominant force that they have been for the last few years. At Super League Basketball, um, I have a little bit more faith in, in purely because they're a bit more open to dialogue. Um, and they have they have made some announcements in the, the last few days. They announced um what the competition format would look like uh, and also a kit deal with Reebok so those are good signs I would say and I I think we have to acknowledge that you know they were starting from scratch really not so long ago so they've had to kind of um you know spring into action pretty quickly and, and try and get this thing up and running but we we still don't know how they got a TV deal you know is it's going to be on Sky like the BBL was before um and again, like from a communications point of view, I think there's a lot that they could still do to actually get the word out about this competition, what it's going to look like, why it's different to what's come before, why people who may not have gone before should go to this one and so on and so forth. So, I mean, they, they've, they've got a big job on their hands on, on multiple fronts, one of them being communicating and the other one, of course, being um trying to find a way to make domestic basketball a viable business in this country. So an enormous thanks to Frank for all of that, like a great insight into all the reporting he did, everything around it and this entire story, helping bring it forward. As many of you tuning in will know, we got even more news overnight involving Sam Decker. Uh, I've linked to that story earlier, but the links I'm going to be putting below, I'm going to be linking to where you can find Frank on Twitter, so please follow him if you use Twitter still, uh, but also to Frank's big motherload story, the really big long explainer he's done for Sid AM. Uh, obviously, follow Frank, he's brilliant, and uh, definitely read his story because it's a really good explainer uh, about this whole situation. And thank you all for tuning in. Uh, the support for the channel is always appreciated, and we've got lots more coming up. As always, the videos are Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This week's Friday video was, uh, even though considering the topic's quite amusing, was delayed for a few hours by another development in the London Lions. That's Sam Decker one. That's kind of wild to me, at least. If you haven't already, please subscribe. It really, really does help. And I suppose, for now, I can listen. You know, it's been great. Good talking to you. Uh, share, tell your friends, and I will see you soon.